welcome back to inside the black box and today's black box is something which most people won't have had uh, in their living rooms growing up unless you lived in Japan of course and that is the classic Nintendo Famicom uh, this is the machine which later was taken to the US and released as the NES the Nintendo Entertainment System uh, so this machine dates back to the design is dates back to 1983 uh, and it was perhaps the most successful video game console of all time. Um, Nintendo did something really amazing after the video game crash in the US, which happened around kind of 1982 timeframe, uh, Nintendo managed to essentially rebuild the games industry from the ground up uh, and turn it into, you know, the massive giant it is today. Uh, and this is the machine that started everything. So uh, the Famicom was not the first machine, game machine, that Nintendo had worked on, of course. Uh, before the Famicom, they had released uh, the Game & Watch, which were kind of small integrated uh, games using liquid crystal displays. Uh, you bought the machine and it had one game on it only. Um, and the games were quite fun for the time, actually. Um, you would kind of, you know, play the game. It also functioned as a digital watch and an alarm. Um, but what's interesting about this machine is that it is the first Nintendo machine to allow you to play multiple games through the use of cartridges, of course. Uh, cartridges were not a Japanese invention. They were invented by Fairchild Electronic, uh, which is an American company with the uh, um, Model F, I believe it was called. Somebody can correct me in the comments if that's wrong. Uh, so I uh, got this particular machine uh, from eBay. It actually came to me from Japan, from a shop in Akihabara. Uh, it's actually for parts. So this little guy is unfortunately not playing any more games. Um, it is possible to get these still working if you want to play Japanese games on original hardware. Uh, these machines, when I said they were uh, the most successful console of all time, uh, this is what I mean. The first models came out in 1983. They were stopped being manufactured in 2003, which means that they were producing these for 20 solid years. And the only reason Nintendo stopped producing them was because some of the parts which are inside the thing were no longer available, right? Uh, and in fact, you could still get uh, original repair parts for the machine until 2007. So that's an absolutely incredible lifetime for any piece of electronics, right? 20 solid years. Um, so let's have a look at it from the outside first. Uh, and then once we kind of understand everything is put together, we can uh, take off the screws and see what's inside. So if you own a NES, you probably notice a couple of interesting differences right off the bat. First of all is the general shape of the machine. It's very, very different from the American machine. The American machine was essentially a big gray brick, which looked more like a VCR than a uh, anything else. Um, there was a good reason for that. Nintendo, because of the game crash in the US, was trying to make their game machine not look like a game machine so that people wouldn't associate it as being you know, a shoddy product. But in Japan, that stigma didn't exist, so they felt free to uh, make it look however they liked. Uh, it uses this kind of red and white uh, color scheme and also in the controllers they've got this front plate which has kind of got this golden foil in. Uh, this color scheme of gold foil with this shade of kind of burgundy red is actually uh, something that existed in the Game & Watch. And in fact if you look at this controller, um, the D-pad, the A and B buttons, uh, the golden red color scheme, that is very much what the, uh, a lot of the Game & Watch machines look like. Um, so they kind of carried through the, they were already starting to define a kind of design language for Nintendo products in the 80s, and it kind of carried through from the Game & Watch to the uh, Famicom. Um, so right at the front it says Family Computer, that's what Famicom stands for, right? It's Famicom, uh, that's a kind of uh, a way of contracting words, which is quite common in the Japanese language. Um, the machine was supposed to originally be called the Gamecom, that uh, was the trademark. Um, but Masayuku Umera, who was the project lead, uh, he kind of presented the idea to his wife one day and she argued that it would be better to call it a Famicom family computer because it would kind of imply that it's something that, you know, everybody can sit together around the TV in the evenings and play. Um, and actually, as it turns out, this machine ended up being much more than just a game uh, computer. You could actually buy a keyboard to plug in and a basic cartridge and you could actually program this machine right in the same way that uh, you could have taken a Commodore 64 or something and hooked it up to your TV. And actually internally uh, this has got quite a lot of processing power so this would have made a pretty good basic machine actually. Um, so what's interesting about this I find is that there's a kind of mix of English and Japanese writing on the front. Uh, this was never exported to the US or to Europe actually as it was. Uh, this machine went to, um, I believe, uh, South Korea. Uh, they sold a version of it. And then, of course, it was copied 
uh, by various kind of uh, Japanese uh, Chinese companies. Uh, you know, back when a lot of Chinese industry was about you know copying, creating bootleg products, um, they created copies which look very much like this. And in fact, in South Africa, growing up. Um, the machine you would have played Nintendo games on was a thing that looked similar to this, but it was a kind of hideous fake golden color and red, and it was called the Golden China Machine, which was sold by a toy store called Reggie's. Um, but generally it had the same layout. So what we have here is we've got a power button here, which is a kind of flip up and down switch. Uh, the reset button is just a regular push button. Um, and then we've got this thing here, which is the opening to the cartridge slot. Um, and this is quite nice actually because the machine kind of sits like this and if you close the slot you can prevent dust and various things from getting in there. Uh, so that's actually a pretty nice feature. You just kind of pop it open and put your cartridge. Uh, the other thing that is quite interesting is this thing. Um, it's, it's labeled eject and the idea is that when you put your cartridge in here you push this button to kind of help you remove it. And it's pretty much unnecessary. If you, it, The amount of force that it takes to insert a cartridge into this machine is about equivalent to what you have with NNES, right? I mean, it's not like you have to be Arnold Schwarzenegger to pull these things out. Um, but the reason they put it in, you know, uh, Masayuki Uemura uh, said at some point that he thought that kids would like to play with a button and kind of mess with it. Um, so, yeah, why not? We'll see uh, when we take the top off exactly. It, it does actually help you pull out the cartridge, even though you don't need it. We'll see how that, how that works in a minute. Um, so the one thing which I think is super cool about this, the design of this machine is how it handles the controllers. The machine itself has these kind of recessed wells and the controllers have these kind of bumps on the side so that the controllers actually slide in there and you can move the machine around and the controllers stay in place. That is really cool. Because one of the things that's really kind of you know annoying about having lots of video game consoles is that controllers and cables are just all over the place. And this kind of gives you a neat little place to put them. That's super cool. I wish that that had made it into the NES. Um, Apart from that, uh, we've got another interesting difference from the uh, American machine is that we've got this plug here, um, which has got a whole lot of pins. There's probably like 15 or 17 pins in there. And this is used supposedly for uh, external peripherals. So for example, uh, Rob the Robot, uh, that kind of peripheral plugged in through here. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if there was anything else, but that was the kind of the intention. The American machine had a similar layout uh, it had a plug kind of at the bottom underneath the machine uh, which was not used at all ever um, other than that the machine is kind of uh, pretty small actually much smaller than the nes at the back we've got uh, all the kind of uh, plugs we've got it's it, it supports only tv out right so it's only got the uh, antenna rf uh, switch here or the rf plug here uh, the nes the american release supported this and a composite video plug which this one doesn't have you can select which channel on your TV it's going to be, uh, whether it's going to appear as TV or game on your TV, and then you've got the power adapter. It just takes a plain vanilla, I think it's 9 volt adapter. But notice this, which is quite interesting. The controllers are not plugged into the machine. They're kind of permanently attached to these sockets at the back. And the reason Nintendo did that is because you save a little bit of money directly soldering cables to the motherboard rather than uh, you know, buying a plug and a socket for your machine. Uh, and I'm kind of curious as to why that didn't happen in the American version. Uh, perhaps it's because Nintendo was hoping to produce additional controllers. And of course, if you want to be able to change controllers, you've got to have a plug, right? Uh, whereas, you know, when they built the Famicom, which was a full year before the NES, uh, maybe at the time they thought, yeah, we're not going to do additional controllers. So we just, you know, hardwire them in. Uh, so that's kind of the machine on the outside. Uh, the other thing it's got is it's got these little kind of uh, air vents at the back. Uh, it's got passive cooling. There's no fan or anything. And there's really nothing in here that produces a lot of heat, as we'll see when we open it up. Uh, but it's always good practice when you make electronic products to allow a place for the heat uh, to escape, uh, especially if you're building for countries that have really hot summers, right? I mean, Japan gets pretty hot. Uh, it'll easily climb into the hundreds. So if your machine is generating, you know, 80, 90 degrees when it's running, and the ambient temperature is in the hundreds, well, the overall temperature that you're, that the motherboard and the electronics are feeling is quite high. So it's good to leave a little bit of place for the air to escape. Um, uh, often, of course, in the 80s, if you know 80s electronics, they like to put kind of, you know, grids and that kind of design. So it kind of fulfills two purposes. Uh, at the bottom, pretty simple. Uh, it's got another air vent here. And this is important, right? You can't just have one air vent on your machine. You have to create a path 
for air to enter and then rise out, right? Because hot air rises. So the idea is that the air would enter through here and then rise out the back vent that we just looked at. Uh, here's the serial number. Here's the model number. It's actually, uh, if you have an American NES, you'll have noticed the model number is always NES dash something. Here they're called HVC dash something. This one is HVC dash 001. Uh, and it says Nintendo Co. Limited, 1983, made in Japan. And here it's got some other information. I, I don't know how to read Japanese, so I can't tell you what that says. But, you know, pretty cool to have all the signage in Japanese. Now, before we get to actually opening up the uh, console itself, let's stop and take a minute at this second controller, right? The controllers are labeled 1 and 2, and they both have a D-pad and an A and B button. But only controller number 1, uh, which is this one, had the start and select buttons. Controller number 2 instead... Uh, had this thing here, these two controls. This is a microphone and they've got something here which is labeled volume. Uh, it's not actually volume, it's gain. Gain is, uh, it's kind of the inverse of volume, right? Like a speaker has, vo the more volume a speaker has, the louder it goes. The more gain a microphone has, the more sensitive it is, right? So it's kind of like how sensitive it is. Um, and this is interesting because this feature never made it into the American release of the machine, right? You, you don't get a controller that has anything other than buttons as input. Um, now, I don't know why that is. I haven't been able to find any good research explaining that. Perhaps it's the fact that uh, not a lot of Japanese developers used the feature, and so they thought it wasn't worth the extra cost because, uh, you know, when we take the back of this, you'll see there's a bunch of extra parts in there which you got to pay for. Um, there were literally four or five games that made a use of this. Um, there was a uh, common Rider game, I think, where there was a, a stage where you had to like make a windmill turn in the game, and the way you do that is by blowing into the microphone. Uh, and then Raid on Bungalow Bay, which is, of course, Will Wright's first game, right, before he did uh, SimCity and The Sims, uh, that used the microphone in the Japanese version for doing commands, but not in the American version, so that's kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, it's a kind of quirky little feature of the Japanese machine. So let's, uh, let's take the back off and see what that looks like. Uh, and it's just got, you know, six standard screws. The plastic feels like it's really nice quality. I got to say, um, it feels really solid. Uh, it's got a kind of texture to it where you feel it's ridgy. And that's nice because, you know, as you're playing and your hands get sweaty, it gives you a little bit more grip so that the uh, controller doesn't fall. And one thing which is way nicer than the American controller is it has got rounded edges all around. So it's really comfy to hold. Uh, that's something that I also wish I'd made it. Uh, into the American version. So let's take all these screws out. And nope, we still got a couple of resisting, of course. It'd be too easy if they all popped out simultaneously. There's one, and there's the other one. Okay. All right, so let's raise the top off here. Oh, there we go. Okay. So if you remember from the uh, video we did a while back on the uh, NES controller, uh, you remember it had one chip inside, which was a uh, 4021B, uh, the shift register, which did basically encoding all the buttons into a small number of cables. And that's still here. There it is, right? It says MN4021B, uh, and that is serving the exact same function, right? You've got the D-pad, A and B, and those are being converted into your uh, clock data and latch signals, you know, through this guy. But there's an additional chip here, and what this chip does uh, is it actually handles the conversion of the sound volume into a digital signal which will flow back along the cable. Uh, so if we just lift this PC board out, uh, it's actually not screwed itself. The same screw that we took out from the back goes through the back, through the PC board and to the front. So everything is kind of held in place by single screws. Okay, let me just undo these squiggles. Oh, we didn't talk about these squiggles. Uh, when we did the NES controller, you'll notice that the cable is threaded through these posts to have it to give it squiggles. The reason they do this uh, is actually just very clever. So when you've got a device like this, which is connected by a cable back somewhere, and this is meant to be held by a person, uh, there is a chance, of course, that the person is going to be pulling the cable. They're going to hit the extender cable, and then it's going to like, you know, bang, you're going to hit the limit. Now, if you don't have these things threaded, what's going to happen is... When I pull, the stress of that force is going to happen on the soldered joints here. And these soldered joints don't have a lot of uh, strength to them. So it could actually be that, you know, I pull on the cable, it snaps, and then it pulls out some of these connections, in which case your controller is busted, right? But by threading it through these posts, what I'm doing is I'm essentially transferring the energy 
into compressing these posts together. So if I pull, what I'm trying to do is actually bend these posts out of shape. So at the worst case, what will happen is I'll crack one of these posts, which is fine. It's just a piece of plastic. It doesn't affect the functioning of the machine. But by doing so, I'll absorb the energy of the tug and I'll save my solder joints, right? So the American release has this. Most uh, kind of controllers that you'll find which are on the end of a cable have this feature, right? To kind of save the solder joints. Because every time something breaks, what happens is your customer gets on the phone and they complain uh, and then you have to send them a replacement and that is super expensive. You want to avoid um, replacing parts if possible. Not only is it expensive in terms of you got to give whoever it is a free controller, but also, of course, you now have an unhappy customer, which, you know, is you can't really estimate how much money that's worth. Uh, so this is controller two then. Uh, it looks very similar to the NES controller. You've got your uh, uh, switches here for the D-pad. There's A and B. Uh, and then you've got your chips and they've added this thing here, this little silver thing. Um, this little silver thing is of course the microphone. It's a very simple uh, piezoelectric microphone. Um, interestingly, this is exactly the same technology if you had an old PC and it had the PC speaker sounds or the speaker in a uh, ZX Spectrum, for example, it's the exact same technology. You can take a piezoelectric speaker, hook it up slightly differently, and it becomes a microphone and vice versa, right? So uh, that's what that is. And then you've got a capacitor here. Uh, whenever you've got kind of sound software, you have these capacitors. And like I meant, uh, said before, they act as filters, right? So if you've got uh, spikes to the noise or the noise suddenly gets way too loud, uh, this will prevent, you know, a spike of electricity going to your sensitive electronics below. Uh, so, you know, pretty simple design. Um, and this is then controller two. Okay, I've taken off all the screws, uh, just regular six regular Phillips head screws, self tappers, nothing kind of magical there. Uh, this is still before Nintendo decided to go all proprietary on their security screws, which happened in the kind of early 90s. So now we are just trying to gently free this machine. Oh. And this is just absolutely jam packed with pieces internally. Uh, they made this very, very compact. It's always been a kind of feature of Japanese electronics that they try and make things as compact as possible. Um, I'm not sure why that is. Somebody told me that, uh, you know, Japanese houses tend to be smaller than European and American houses. So space is always at a premium and consumers are actually looking for small devices. Uh, I don't know if that's true. If, you've, uh, if you're Japanese or lived in Japan, you can tell us if that's the case. Uh, okay, so this is what the machine looks like internally. Uh, it's got a kind of interesting shape to it. Um, we've got two PC boards here, this kind of light colored one at the back, which is connected to the power, um, the channel selectors, and then the RF out. Uh, and then a separate board here, which has got kind of the, uh, the bulk of the interesting stuff. And here we've got the cables coming in from the controllers and they kind of route through uh, to these disconnects here. And what's interesting is even, uh, Internally, you can see that the cable is kind of wound around one of these posts to prevent, um, you know, it's to absorb the energy like I just described. You, you don't want to worry just about breaking the controller side, right? If you tug, it might uh, create a stress on both sides. And you definitely don't want the, str the energy of a tug breaking something on your controller board because, okay, sending someone a new controller is like, you know, it'll cost you a couple of bucks but you'd have to send them a whole new machine. So this one is definitely important. Um, one very nice design feature here again. I mean, Nintendo just really has got fantastic uh, industrial design. Um, the cables have got these very well-defined channels, which are actually uh, built into the plastic for the cable to thread through. And this does just a bunch of cool things. Uh, first of all, it makes sure that the cable that you cut for this uh, uh, you know, for this controller, it makes it much easier to measure the, the, the length required because by making it straight, you're kind of guaranteeing the distance. Uh, second of all, it guarantees that when the person who is assembling this has got a very easy job of making sure that the cable doesn't get pinched when you put the top together, you know. And thirdly, if you're doing testing of this machine or repairing it and you have to kind of be working on all these electronics, you guarantee that this cable doesn't kind of strain the way because, you know, if, you, if you're repairing this and you've got your soldering iron, you know, and you're kind of working on this here and this cable is kind of straying in the way, you could burn this insulation and now you've got a problem because now you've got to replace this cable to give it good insulation. So just small details like that really show that this is a high quality product and the people who built it really 
you know, understood what it's like to mass produce electronics. So very cool feature. Um, but anyway, let's, uh, let's keep going. Uh, this is the underside. So what's nice about this as well, you'll notice is that the way you build this machine is you take the, the top, you put it down on the table and you just kind of add things in layers, screw it all together. And at this point it's done. And then we just add the top, right? You don't want to be in a position where you kind of have parts that you're assembling here and parts that you're assembling at the top and then you try and kind of you know sandwich them together carefully because that would mean that you're going to have cables that need to connect between the top and the bottom and those might get squished as you kind of try and close it or sandwich between something super simple to build right you put everything in layers bang 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 screw it all tight put the top on screw it and you're done right uh, that shows that this is a company that understands how to do really mass production without having to worry about the people who are building it introducing faults by accident right very cool all right so let's keep taking things apart we'll start with this top pc board uh which has got the power and then the uh modulator stuff uh you recall what a modulator is from last time when we discussed the uh timex sinclair zx81 uh a modulator is basically the device which takes the video signal which the processor the cpu is put together uh, and then converts it into basically a fake TV transmission so that uh, the antenna on your TV can understand it. Uh, so let's just pop this one out. Um, there it is. It looks very similar to the uh, modulator on the uh, ZX81, right? It's inside a shielded case. And this is actually important. I mean, this machine being Japanese wasn't subject to FCC rules. Uh, but if you are working with modulators, they give out a lot of radiation. I mean, not radiation like Chernobyl radiation, right? It's not going to kill you. But it is going to, for example, if you had your Nintendo running and someone's listening to the radio next to it, it could interfere with that radio broadcast. Or if there's a policeman outside trying to call, you know, for an ambulance, it could interfere with that. So, you know, there's rules around that kind of stuff. Um, and this board looks quite different to this board here, the actual main uh, game board. Uh, which kind of tells me this is probably designed by somebody outside of Nintendo and they just kind of bought it as a third-party part. That's pretty common, right? Um, I mean, Nintendo is a, a company that's trying to build game machines. They don't need to understand how modulators and you know power supplies work. They can just publish a spec to somebody else and say, hey, we're looking for a modulator that's got these specs and we want to be able to handle so much voltage, etc. And then they just build it for you and then you put it into your device, right? Very common, subcontract the pieces out. Um, Kind of hidden down here. Let's see if we can get a view of that. Uh, let's see. Get a little closer. There we go. So hidden here, this piece, this is the exact same piece you recall when we talked about uh, in the uh, Timex Sinclair ZX81. This piece here is a 7805 voltage regulator. Uh, and what this does is you will input 9 volts or something here and this will knock it down to 5 volts which is what the Nintendo uses internally. And like I said, you know, this is a very common part. Well, there it is again, right? This, uh, the ZX81 was manufactured in the US. This is manufactured in Japan, the exact same part. Uh, these are super, super cheap, uh, but they do give off heat, right? So this is why, uh, if you'll notice where the modulator was, this is the heat vents, right? So this part nestles in there nicely. So your heat generating part is right in front of the vents. Um, so in the uh, ZX81, you remember they had a kind of aluminum block, which was the heat sink. These guys very cleverly, again, you know, Nintendo, um, the heat sink for the 7805 is actually this little um, radio frequency cage. So this thing does double duty, right? It prevents radiation from getting out and it acts at your heat sink. That's just very cool. Okay, so I've taken the screws off the main board and we kind of hinge it open. And it kind of opens up like a book. Very nice, right? Uh, it's held in place by a couple of disconnects. So I'm just going to unplug these. So this is the disconnect for controller two. And here's controller one. Oh, actually, sorry, other way around. This is controller two. Um, and then this cable here, which is kind of winds its way. This uh, white and orange cable is actually the voltage in, right? Actually, no, sorry, that's the voltage out. So this will take from the 7805, which is here, out to everything else. Um, so this board here then is the uh, the bulk of the machine. Let's zoom in a little. Uh, so we talked last time about uh, the basic parts of a computer uh, and this is really just a computer, right? I mean, when we say a computer, we mean a computing device. Uh, a gaming console really is just a computer with a different set of IO. Uh, specifically, what makes consoles of the time different from computers is that your IO, uh, sorry, your um, 
memory buses would have been routed through the connector here to the game cartridge which is most of your memory right your roms are in there um, so we should be expecting to find in this board uh, the same kinds of things which we found in zx81 so we should be expecting to find ram right memory for the computer to do its work we should be expecting to find uh, some kind of io controller for the con uh, io control device for the controllers right the uh, the game pads uh, we should be expecting to find a CPU somewhere. So let's see what we have, right? Again, not super complicated. It's got a, little, a few more chips than the uh, uh, ZX81. Uh, this giant blue thing here, by the way, is the reset switch. This thing is like way too big for this purpose. I mean, you are like sending five volts through this. You could probably send like, you know, 20 or 30 volts through this thing. I'm not sure why they used it other than perhaps, you know, it, it's the right physical size for the purpose, who knows? Um, but anyway, let's see what we got. Oh boy, this is just full of dust and dust bunnies and everything else. All right, well, anyway, let's see what we got. So the interesting thing to begin with are these two kind of big long chips here. Uh, there is this one here and this one here. Um, this one is called an RP2A03E and this one is an RP2C02E. Now these two chips are the bulk of what the NES does. Uh, this one is the CPU. And this one is what's called a PPU. Uh, PPU is a kind of Nintendo term. We'll come back to that in a second. This is the main CPU. So basically this will be doing uh, the memory reads and writes. It will be generating uh, the sound. It will be uh, issuing commands to the control pads to figure out what the player is doing. It'll have the, uh, the game clock to make sure that you know, you're drawing the frames at the right speed, etc. Um, all that stuff is handled by this chip. Now, what's interesting about this chip, it's called a 2A03. Um, that is manufactured by, oh, it's a Japanese company whose name I forget right now. Maybe Fujitsu. I'll, I'll look that up for you. Um, but essentially what this chip is, is a license built uh, MOS 6502. And the 6502 is important because it is the same processor which powered the Apple II, the Commodore 64, and a host of other computing devices from the 80s, right? So Nintendo wanted to use the 6502 directly, but Moss at the time was not sure that they'd be able to fulfill the volume of their order. So Moss, instead of losing the order, decided that they would rather sell license to build. In other words, they would essentially rent the plans for the chip to this Japanese manufacturer um, so that they could provide Nintendo. And the way licensing typically works is if I I'll give you a license to manufacture my chips, uh, you sell them for whatever price you want, but you give me, you know, some percentage, a buck or two per chip that you sell. Uh, so that way, Moss is able to make some money off the deal, even though they can't actually keep up with, uh, you know, manufacturing demand. So this is essentially means that the Famicom and the NES, the NES had the exact same CPU internally, um, were in the same class of power as the uh, Commodore 64, right? Uh, would have been running at roughly the same clock speed, so they would have had basically the same computing power. Now, the thing that set the NES apart uh, from its uh, other, from the other machines that used the 6502, you know, arguably not the Commodore 64, because that thing is holy and nobody is allowed to say anything bad about it in my presence. Uh, but really it's this chip here. This chip here, which is the RP2C03, um, this, sorry, uh, RP2C02. This is the PPU and this is the picture processing unit. So this is essentially the graphics card of the Famicom, right? And so you can tell, like just look at the relative sizes of these two chips. Um, there is probably an equivalent amount of processing power here than there was here. Now it's a little bit kind of tricky because inside this chip there is also some dedicated memory, uh, but this chip does only one thing. It just assembles the picture, that's it. So this frees up this chip to do other things, and this chip just does that. So in a sense, you kind of, you know, already have extra processing power compared to, for example, the Apple II. Um, and one of the things that the, uh, the NES, uh, sorry, the Famicom PPU was very good at was putting together what were called uh, tile views. So any Nintendo game uh, is basically put together by putting tiles on the screen. Uh, and each tile is kind of drawn from a pellet. So you can imagine you might have a tile that looks like a tree and a tile that looks like a mushroom and a tile that looks like some water. Um, you can then kind of, you know, stick those tiles to the screen to create a very complex and huge map while only using a little bit of memory because you only need to use, you know, the memory required for the pictures of the tree, the mushroom and the uh, water. But 
you can have many of them on the screen at the same time. So, you know, this was uh, used for doing things like, you know, drawing the tiles, etc. And then we have a bunch of other chips here, which are, um, uh, we have some RAM here, uh, which is the RAM here. I believe these two are the RAMs. Uh, uh, this would have been, I think, 16K and 16K there. And then these are just chips which are used for other kind of, you know, glue logic and various things. And down here we've got um, these two controllers. Each one is connected, you'll notice, very close to the uh, plug around the controller. Um, so these are actually, uh, we talked about how the uh, NES controller encoded the signal to send it down the cable. These guys kind of help with the decoding of it. Um, now, uh, you, you, some of you are probably watching and saying, hey, these are plugs for the controllers, dude. You said that Nintendo saved money by not putting tug plugs for the controllers. What gives? Uh, yes, that is true. Um, these things are called disconnects in electronics. They are like plugs, but if you can see, they are kind of crappy. Um, they have a lot less plastic to them. They're, very, they're not very robust. And the intent of a disconnect is not to kind of rigidly hold a cable in place the way a regular plug does. Uh, because plugs are kind of on the outside of the machine and they have to put up with the rigors of being in the outside world. Disconnects are always inside the case, nice and safe. Uh, the reason you want to have a disconnect is if while you're testing the machine, let's say we discover the controller is bad for some reason. Now, if the controller were directly soldered onto this board, you have to flip this board over, get your soldering iron, unsolder the cables, put it back. It takes ages, right? Disconnect, what we can do is just Oh, it looks like this controller back, unplug, throw the controller over the wall to somebody else who's going to do in-depth testing of it, and then plug a new controller in here and we're on our way, right? So even though this it costs more money than having directly soldered cables, it costs less money than a real plug, and if something goes wrong on your production line, which it always will, right? I mean, they would have manufactured tens of millions of these of these things. Even if your error rate is like, you know, 0.0001% of your machines are bad. When you're dealing with tens of millions, you're gonna have hundreds of bad machines. You can deal with this quickly. You know, you don't have to stop the production line. You can just plug, plug, and we're done, right? So that's why we use disconnects and electronics. Um, and then at the bottom, we've got this uh, expansion port, uh, which is just kind of soldered in directly. Uh, and at the bottom, it's really nothing interesting. It's just got the, uh, it's a single layer board. Uh, and then over here, I don't know if you can see, it says uh, copyright Nintendo 1983 HVC CPU. Let me get rid of some of these dust bunnies. HP CPU 05. Uh, and everything is very nicely labeled on this board. Let me just not drop everything. Uh, so we can see here it says uh, uh, PPU. Here it says CPU. Uh, here it says U8. Here it says U7. Uh, here it says SRAM 2K. Oh, sorry. This is 2K of memory. Here's another 2K and so on. Um, and that's nice for people who are trying to repair the machine later because you might plug this machine into a, a testing unit, which Nintendo uh, would have produced, right? If you were a, a licensed Nintendo repairman, they would have sent you a testing machine. Somebody comes to you, hey, my Famicom bust. You would plug it in, uh, plug in a special cartridge which connected it back to the uh, testing unit. The testing unit might say, oh yeah, U8 is bad. So then you say, okay, cool. So you look on the board and you say, oh yeah, this one is U8. It says so right there. So now you know I gotta swap this guy out. So that makes uh, troubleshooting and just communicating technical details much, much easier, right? Because you don't have to try and describe things. You can just call them by their name in the right here. Uh, the final thing that's interesting on this board is this connect up here. Uh, this long connector is obviously for the cartridge, right? Uh, and if you count these pins, it's only got 60 pins as opposed to the 72 that the American machine used. Uh, and if we take an American cartridge, I've got the cybernoid, um, and we try and plug it in, you'll notice that uh, it is way longer than the, uh, than the Japanese socket, right? And the reason they did that, as we talked about before, is this has 12 pins in the middle, the American cartridge, uh, which would have connected down to the uh, extra socket at the bottom of the machine. Uh, the Japanese version didn't have that. Now, what's interesting about this uh, connector, though, is while most of these electronic parts would not have been manufactured by Nintendo directly, right? The PPU, they got uh, the PPU and CPU that would have gotten manufactured by somebody else. Uh, these little kind of jelly bean parts you would have just gotten from some mass manufacturer. Um, this connector, Nintendo did manufacture themselves, and the reason for that is they understood from the experience that Fairchild and Atari and other game uh, cartridge-based game manufacturers had had that having loose connections on a cartridge was really bad, right? 
And the reason it's really bad is because you're essentially connecting each of these pins directly to either the CPU or the PPU for reading and writing memory. So if you fail to read a piece of memory, then unpredictably bad things are going to happen to your game. So they understood that the quality of these connections to the cartridge was absolutely paramount to the quality of the machine, right? If you had bad connections, then the machine was going to be crappy, which is something, of course, American users discovered when Nintendo switched to the horizontal cartridge uh, installation in the NES. But in this original machine, they decided that in order to ensure the quality of connector, they would manufacture their own, uh, which cannot have been something that that was very cheap to do. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Uh, the final thing that we're going to look at then is uh, the eject button. Uh, <laughs> the eject button is ridiculously complicated. So this kind of, uh, oh, zooming in the wrong direction. Here we go, uh, a little bit out. This giant kind of uh, plastic piece here is the eject button. And the way it works is uh, the button is up here connected. So I can kind of slide this whole piece along. And it's got a spring here, which is just connected to this post to make sure it returns. So as I push this, this whole kind of plastic piece slides forward. And this plastic piece, I wonder if I can remove it actually, so you can see more clearly. There we go. This plastic piece is actually a, uh, a wedge. So what happens is you've got the cartridge. I mean, it wouldn't be in the American cartridge, right? But same principle. You've got the cartridge here. When you push the eject button, it kind of pushes the wedge and kind of, you know, levers this thing out. And that's kind of how the eject button worked. Uh, and judging by the kind of wear and tear on the arms of this one, it looked like it actually was used by somebody. Um, so that then is a Nintendo Famicom. Um, very nice industrial design internally. Uh, really powerful processor for its day, uh, some weird kind of cool interesting game innovations with the speaker and so on, and really possibly the most influential and successful video game console in history. Uh, so, you know, a real piece of history and, uh, you know, I hope that somebody, uh, I might actually put this little guy back on eBay so somebody else can use him for spare parts. Um, so there we go. Uh, thanks for joining us. Next week we are going to look at another Nintendo product uh, something that was also equally famous and important for the company. Uh, we'll keep it a secret, see if you can guess what it is. Other than that, take care and we'll see you for the next one.